All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sam, Sam Jack, and um, I am a librarian at Newton Public Library. And uh, it's great to, great to be with you for our fourth Tuesday photography program this month. Um, super excited to welcome uh, Kayleen Nisley, a great photographer from Hutchinson, who's going to be talking about uh, From Refugee to Home. Uh, just a couple announcements uh, from the library before I turn it over to Kayleen. Um, if you look on our look on our website newtonplks.org and go to the calendar tab, you can kind of see what's coming up. Um, we've got a book discussion coming up on September second, um, as well as um, a live library update um, on the September tenth. We've got top twenty music sites with our tech guy Nathan. That should be a lot of fun. There's some other stuff going on too. And if you've got kids, we've got our fall programs for kids uh, starting up that you can learn more about on our Facebook page. Uh, so that's probably enough to say about that for, na for now. Um, so I'll just uh, turn it over to uh, Kayleen and uh, let her kind of introduce herself and uh, feel free to, you're all muted right now, but feel free to type in the chat uh, during Kayleen's uh, talk. And then afterward, we'll open up the floor for uh, audio discussion and, and Q and A and that kind of stuff. So welcome, Kayleen. Thank you. This is the first time that I've given a presentation on Zoom. So bear with me if we have any <clears throat> glitches related to that. Um, I am a therapist and um, photographer and filmmaker and magazine editor and um, uh, sometimes writer uh, living in Hutchinson, Kansas. Um, but most importantly, I'm mom. So my day-to-day uh, -day is here on the computer with clients connecting in this way, but that's usually a one-on-one. -on -one. So it's a little bit different to see you all as really tiny little boxes. Um, I... <clears throat> wear a lot of hats and that creates a lot of different places that those titles intersect and so this show um that we're gonna get to is one of my, the favorite one of my favorite places that i found an intersection um between um, my work as a, a social worker and um a chance to be able to be a photographer um, I love storytelling and that's kind of the, kind of the bowl that, that holds all of the things that I do together. Um, it's the style of photography that I get most excited about. Um, I am a narrative therapist, which means I use, um, story and, and, ideas around that with my clients every day. Um, and I think you can read there that I think stories are like one of the most powerful um, things in our, our lives. Um, I think the stories that we hold dear, um, that we allow to move us, um, are, are just like a fundamental part of our life. And so I want to share this story with you or these stories with you. Um, stories of my friends who all live in Wichita um, right now and who I uh, got to meet by volunteering with the IRC. Um, I have been um, exposed to or like had the chance to know um, refugees since I was I think 18 here in this picture. Um, I was a freshman in college and um, there was an offer to earn some extra credit to write a, a really big research paper on the Somali community that was living about 45 minutes from the school I was at and I jumped on it. Um, I had already been involved with photography and thought that photography would be the way that 
I would get to travel. Um, and it was really exciting to find in Columbus, um, Ohio, where I was at the time, that there was this huge community of people with rich culture that they brought with them. And it felt like I was getting to travel the world right there in um, the city that I was living near. Um, so maybe, I don't know how long after that, I was living in Kansas and um, the Syrian war had broken out and uh, people were fleeing and it was all over the news and I like suddenly was like you know I never thought to look if there is a resettlement agency in Kansas if we have refugees here I don't know I think I just thought it's Kansas like there's not a lot of diversity here and so it never crossed my mind the first few years that I was living here um but something about seeing the the people fleeing from Syria just all of a sudden was like, I need to get back involved. Um, so a quick Google search found that there was in fact uh, several, a couple of resettlement agencies at the time in Wichita, Kansas, and that they were resettling people from all over the world. And I got involved right away. Um, some friends and I also were involved in a project sewing um, some things for um, the people who were fleeing Syria. And um, it built a lot of, helped me build a lot of cool connections here in South Central Kansas about, um, centered around refugee work. Um, so I don't know if um, anyone, I saw that there's some people from IRC on the call, but if everyone knows that we have refugees here in Kansas, because I didn't know that, or about um, the resettlement um, process, um, but I love working with IRC. It stands for International Rescue Committee, and they've been around since before World War II, actually. I think it was started in Europe connected with Albert Einstein um, and the work that they do all over the world is just incredible um, and I'm just really proud to be connected with our office here in Wichita. Um, in Wichita we have people, um, we have some people from Somalia, um, we have a lot of people from the Democratic Republic of Congo um, and the countries kind of surrounding there um, we have some from Iraq and Afghanistan, um, and they also do other work with um, immigration, and um, they're starting to um, make build some connections and do some work related to um, trafficking. So um, there will be information later in the show about ways you can get connected with them, but I, I can't talk enough about how awesome it's been to be connected there. Um, I think maybe three or four years ago, um, every year we celebrate um, World Refugee Day. And so that year we did um, an art installation with uh, the clients and um, got to display them in the shift space gallery at, w well, not at WSU, but owned by WSU. And um, we talked to uh, the clients about like what home represents for them or what they um, remember from their first homes or we had a few prompt questions and uh, they drew some beautiful things and it was really fun to document it and to have them see uh, their pictures up on the wall there. So last year sometime um, McPherson Public Library got in touch and said um, they had some time open on their calendar in a room if um, I had some photography I'd like to display and I had a few things series that I thought would maybe um, work but I decided that I really wanted if we were going to have a chance to have something on the wall I wanted it to be um, something that would um, 
uh, like educate uh, people in South Central Kansas about the refugee community in Wichita. Um, so I talked with um, uh, IRC and we uh, connected with clients um, and this would be like a photography related um, idea is that it was really important to us to make sure that we worked with clients that um, understood what the photos were going to be used for and um, could like freely consent to having their photos taken. Um, you at times can come across stories in photojournalism or uh, Nat Geo has some history of maybe less than um, ethical situations in which photos were taken. And so um, it was really important to us to make sure the clients knew uh, what was going on and what they would be used for. So I ended up with a series of images of our clients that live in Wichita and included um, a, a story with each of them. Um, so it uh, was gonna move and be at, at Newton um, but then COVID happened, so here we are, and I'm going to go through it with you tonight. And I'm so excited for you um, to meet my friends here. Oops. This is Hala. Um, she and her daughters fled from Syria. Um, and she told me stories about what it was like before she left. Um, one of the stories that stuck with me most was that before they decided to leave Syria, they were trying to have as normal of a life as possible. So there were bombs falling constantly. Um, their upstairs neighbor was killed on their porch um, just above them, just feet from them. Um, and yet they continued to go to school every day. And more than that, they, well, I asked her, I said, you went to school even when that was going on? And she said, we, we had to do something. We couldn't just sit at home and wait and wait for it, the bombs to hit. Um, and more than that, they went to music lessons after school every day. And as she was telling me this story, I think it kind of struck her for the first time that like they were practicing music while the bombs were falling. Um, there's something like so horrible and so beautiful about that, um, that I don't think I'll ever forget that story and and that idea of like um just desperately holding on to your humanity no no matter what is going on around you this is gideon um gideon uh left the can't quite see my. Um, he left the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and he did so as an asylum seeker and had to wait 15 years um, before he, his request to be a refugee was approved. Um, that's actually really common. It can take definitely over 10 years. Um, before all of the paperwork that needs to happen um, gets through. Um, he was an English teacher while he was living. Um, oh, I, can't, I wish I could remember where he was living. Blaze or somebody could probably tell me. Um, oops. But when he got here to Wichita, he um, got a job at the meat packing plant. And I asked him about that because I said, that's a, that's a big difference. And he was so, and is just so grateful for everything. And he said, you know, it wasn't a great job, but I was just so happy to be here and to be safe and to be um, 
providing for his family. And now he works uh, at IRC and gets to help other refugees as they um, are being resettled here. Meseret. I had the best conversation um, with Meseret. She uh, served me so much food, um, even though I was there to take her picture. And I think that that goes along with what I was saying about um, being a photographer. I was there um, because I wanted to help tell the story, but I could have just said, no, 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 I'm just here to take the picture. But uh, it was really important to her to connect and be able to serve me in that way. And I, I, I loved it so much. Um, so she left from Ethiopia and um, I believe that she went up to Lebanon. I, I'm almost certain somewhere in that area um, to work for a few years before she got um, uh, refugee status and was able to come here. And um, she has been working ever since and she is just so um, excited to be able to work um, the whole time. And uh, she says that when she calls home, she talks to her family, but not her mom, because if she talks to her mom, um, her mom will just cry for weeks. Um, and she hopes one day that she can go back to visit. Um, Dorcas also has worked at IRC. And um, when I talked to her about the journey that she took, um, she and this is also very common, like, isn't quite sure where to identify that she's from. She knows that her family is from DRC, but she was two years old when they left. So her entire life has been in transition. Um, they lived in South Africa for seven years. And so that's where she feels most connected to. Um, but that's a common theme for refugees is to have this sort of um influx identity that like you hear the stories of your family and you connect um with that history but you also don't know it because you've lived your life um in camps or in other countries juliana um she again same story that i was just talking about she grew up um in uganda and has very few memories of the drc um and she has a beautiful daughter here in wichita and um she was so proud to show me her car and her life here and um, was excited about her daughter starting school last year. And I, um, yeah, I think that the tenacity, I guess, that it takes is what's like most humbling for me is just that ability to recreate yourself over and over again as needed in each place. Here's Blaze. Blaze is watching. I think probably sneakily at work. Hopefully he can hear. He was having some issues with his sound. Um, so Blaze works at um, IRC and then he also has another job which he's at right now. Um, and he, he came from the DRC and we are gonna watch a video that Blaze and I made together He's really interested in photography and uh, uh, filmmaking. Um, so we've worked together a little bit on that. Um, so I'm gonna play a video now that he and I made together so that you know more about his story. Um, Cause it's a really powerful one and we want you to know about his wife and his daughter. So hopefully this works and isn't too glitchy. Thank you. 
My name is Blaise Bigaboa. I was born in Congo, DRC Congo in Africa. I went to Burundi when I was 10. Um, I moved there when I was 10 years old and I went to Burundi because of the war. Yes, it was very bad. It's like a night they you you they start shooting. Everybody goes in this way. So we fall mom. All place, all, all the distance. We just hey some people they say, hey, let's go, let's go, let's go. Where I was in, in Congo, we passed the war with with both and we get to go because it was dangerous at that time. It was dangerous. And we find ourselves in Bujumbura. Burundi to the capital city for Bujumbura, Bujumbura. So yeah, we've been there for a long time. And my dad, he went there before us. When the war comes, we separate. My dad go his way and we go with our way with my mom. So we didn't know where is my dad for like one year. He flew Congo, went to Burundi. We were thinking he died, but he didn't die. He was in Burundi. And one day he sent someone in the letter and said, hey, I'm alive, I'm in Burundi. I went to school in Burundi, and secondary school in Burundi, and I met my wife at school. And we've been friends for a couple of months, and we became girlfriend and boyfriend. We lived there uh, accident in 2011, and he, he died. And after my dad died, Everything is go bad, and my mom she was not able to do everything. Even the people from UNCR when they came to my house, they see the situation. Yeah, they see how much my mom she was sick, a stomach pressure. That's how I start learning how to survive about life. After that, 2015 May 20, I came here in, to US. In my family, I'm like that. That's when my dad died told me. Please take care of your sister, take care of your brother. So I'm like that. Even when I came here, we spent two years, two years and a half without my mom working. I'm the one who was paying everything. I go back. 2017, I went back to Burundi, get married, and she became my wife. And by chance, I, she got pregnant. And I came back after just one month. I just stayed there just one month, 10 days. And I came back. It was a very, very bad situation for me because I was wondering to be with my wife and taking care of all my daughter and everything. But I don't got that chance. And I started working with immigration here in Wichita to IRC to see how can I bring my wife here. Here's the first time when I go to see her. And right now, I'm here, I'm waiting for them to come. The process is, is moving on and it's almost to the end. And now they ask me to pay some fees for them to come. Like uh, application fees for the visa for each, my daughter and my wife. I have to buy for them the passport. I have to send them to Nairobi, Kenya, Nairobi is another country in Africa who they're supposed to go there for the embassy to do the interview for visa. I have to book the ticket for them. I have to take to book the hotel. Thank you so much for your support. I am so, so grateful and can't wait to bring my wife and daughter here in the US. Thank you so much. I want um, such good things for Blaze and his family and we have a GoFundMe open and maybe at the end he can update us just a little bit about um, how it's going. I know everything is on hold right now because of COVID, but um, if you search GoFundMe for this, you should be able to get more information there. 
Um, I also connected with IRC before tonight and asked if there are specific ways that they're looking for people to be involved there right now. Um, and there are some remote opportunities. Um, they're doing virtual English instruction instead of the in-person classes. Um, they also need help with resumes. Um, that's always a huge thing is trying to connect people with jobs and that's a skill that you have. Um, it's easy to do that just via email. Um, and then they're also um, doing no contact donations. So it's just picking it up and dropping it off at a house. Um, it doesn't involve uh, having to directly interact with someone if that's a concern. Um, and you can just email them at kansas at rescue.org for any other information or to ask more about those opportunities. So I'm going to open it up now to any questions related to photography. I didn't cover a lot of that, but um, I'd love to talk shop if you want to, or more about the IRC or storytelling or any of those things at this time. Yeah, I think, thank you, Kayleen, very much. Um, I just, uh, those of you in the Zoom meeting, I just changed the settings. So um, you can now unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone in the lower left and uh, ask your question or if you're more comfortable typing in the chat, you can do that. And those on Facebook uh, can also type your questions in the chat. Uh, the Facebook's on about a 20 second delay, but we will get, we will get your question. Um, I guess I'll, um, I'll, I'll kind of start off. Um, so the, the, these, um, these, these portrait photos that you not only got the photos, but but um, you know, can, can share these these stories that that they told you. Um, how did how how did those uh, portrait sessions go? I mean, how long did they last? You know, do you just start snapping away, or or how do how do those work? I find that people are usually really uncomfortable having their photo taken, whether it's in a setting like this or a standard. Uh, family photo sessions. So um, I think it takes a little bit of time just to get people to relax. And so usually was at least a half hour to an hour for the one final um, image um, because we spent that time connecting and I wanted that to be communicated in the photos. Um, it's one thing to take a portrait of someone and it's another thing to like share a little bit of who they are who they are. Um, so that takes uh, a little bit of being present with each other. Um, do you, uh, do you, do you know how, how many, um, do you know, like some statistics, like how, how, how large the refugee community is in this area? How many clients IRC normally has? So I wouldn't, I don't know our overall um, because there are, used to be two offices that were resettling and then also there's like people who come under a slightly different status um, but are still part of the community. Um, but we, IRC was on track to resettle Gosh, I've got it here. I think it was like close to 200. And um, this year has, we've only gotten one family since COVID in March. Mm -hmm. And that's probably going to be the only one that we get for the foreseeable future. Um, I wanna say, wish I could have the numbers in front of me, but. Um, it was last year was a little uh, back and forth because there were different, um, executive, um, whatever proclamations about, um, who could come from what countries and how much, um, the U S has a long history of accepting refugees, um, and, it has never been a partisan issue before um, the last couple of years. And I hope it's something that we can 
get back to agreeing about um, because it's a long, hard process for people to come. There, I don't know that there's any situation where people are more vetted than our clients are. Um, so I have no fears about um, having a vibrant refugee community here. Yeah, yeah Jim, uh, Jim Griggs on, on Facebook, uh, you know, he said great presentation. And then he, he said that, I guess he flew into Wichita from Amsterdam and was on a flight with a refugee from East Africa. He said that their stories are difficult to comprehend. And then kind of commenting, uh, you know, we were complaining about lockdown with, with COVID for the past five or six months, but yet you've got refugees that have been waiting in a camp or in a temporary housing somewhere for 10 plus years. So. And they're still there waiting? in the middle of COVID. And I cannot imagine um, life in a camp during a pandemic. It's, there's just, I can't wrap my head around that people are sitting there still waiting. Yeah. Um, Kat Catherine asked, uh, do you have other exhibitions that you plan for your photographs and uh, stories? Um, well, before COVID, we had a couple of places lined up for these stories um, and everything's just kind of on hold at the moment. So I'm hoping once we get back to in-person museum visits and gallery visits that we can uh, have it at a few places in Wichita. Yeah, I know we'd, we'd act, the library had actually, I'd, we, I'd been talked with Kayleen about having some of her photo, we've got like a little display space um, in our library, but that kind of fell through because of that was kind of when COVID was starting up. Um, so Ada, Ada asked, um, she said, enjoyed this. Uh, what strategies did you use to help refugees feel comfortable talking about their stories, um, especially since they, you know, they likely experience trauma and how do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, that's actually really challenging for me because I have training in, um, trauma work and so it's hard for me sometimes to remember when I'm the photographer and not the therapist um, that comes up for me a lot and so um, you don't ever want someone to feel compelled to share um, something that is disturbing um, so but you also don't want to cut them off and so it's kind of this intuitive balance of not uh, over digging and but making a space for them to to tell their stories. Um, one of the therapy modalities that I work with and love so much is narrative exposure therapy and it um, is just about telling your story and how the process of doing so um, takes the trauma and kind of shrinks it back to just being a part of your story instead of the whole story. And I think I take some of that into these conversations by asking about things that are not only related to um, fleeing or war or um, the really scary things that happen also about uh, family recipes and uh, celebrations and uh, things like that. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, kind of a side, I, this is kind of a side question. Did you, the, I love the mural on your wall there behind you. Did you, did you paint that or? I didn't. Uh, my friend and local artist Brady Scott did. And I've done uh, some films for him of process uh, I don't think we did one for this one, but he's done a lot of murals in Hutch and Wichita. So look him up. He's really cool. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I wonder if, um, if the IRC, I, I guess, you know, the, I, I wonder, it seems like it would be challenging with, with the, the feelings of isolation that, you know, a refugee is by definition someone who's been displaced and hard to, you know, so you, hard to, you know, deal with those feelings of isolation when suddenly everybody's moving to Zoom and, you mm -hmm. know, that's got to be tough for, the, for these folks. 
Yeah, there's a few people here from IRC. Does anybody want to talk? Yeah, yeah, if you'd like to just unmute yourself and And I guess if, if anybody has has a uh, so that would be one thing. And then other th another thing you might, um, you, maybe you could talk a bit about, because I know that in addition to, to these, these kind of uh, storytelling photos, you, you know, you're a professional photographer as well and do have a portrait uh, making practice, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess, um, you know, what, what's your approach to, to make making portrait photos overall and maybe in like technical or, or artistic terms? Sure. Um, I'm not a huge gearhead. I don't know if you say that about photography, but <laughs> I know there are some people who are like intensely passionate about um, what gear they use. Um, but I, a couple of years ago, switched to mirrorless and shoot with Fuji. Um, and there's some things I really love about it. And there's other things that frustrate me. Um, but overall, I love that it's a smaller camera. And for me, um, since it's not about uh, having the best gear and it's more about building the connection with the client, the smaller camera feels better. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the you've got a 70 by 200 on this 5D and you show up with this big, like, intense get up and that shuts people down right away. So um, I love my mirrorless and I keep a 35 millimeter lens on it because that kind of means I have to get a little bit closer. Um, but again, I think that that's better for connections. So um, I love portrait work. Um, I love being able to make people forget that we're having a photo session and relax and just be themselves and then be able to communicate that in photos. Um, one of the things over the past decade that I've been able to photograph and am like most passionate about is birth photography, mm. which usually gets people uh, talking one way or the other. Either they're really excited and they've seen some amazing birth photography or they're like, what are you talking about? I would never let someone do that. Um, but I, I love it so much and it's another chance to um, I, actually, the interesting thing about birth photography is a little bit less about building a connection and a little bit more about being invisible, um, which I also love and just get to like hide and tell the story of what's happening around me. Yeah, well, that would be amazing. It, it's um, that's one of the, the privileges that photographers can get, I guess, is to be in the room where it hap the room where it's happening, you know. Um, <laughs> I like that Hamilton. Yeah, Hamilton, right. Uh, so uh, Jim asked, uh, did you use the Fuji for the video? I did. Okay. Yep. So it does video and the still. That's pretty neat. Yeah, I wasn't super confident about shooting a video with it right at first, but um, it seems to have caught up with what I want it to do. So. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um. Let's see. Oh, I guess on the, um, yeah, you, you know, I, we talked a little bit about this before, um, before the live stream started um, with, I, and this has been in the, in the news as well, you know, with the, um, with, with the, the kind of almost a dead halt to, to refugees um, being able to come in, it's been um, um, also a financial problem for IRC and the, and the other uh, resettlement agencies. Uh, so. Yeah, um, I don't know if anybody from IRC would want to jump on here, but they are doing everything they can um, to kind of diversify their work. Um, if for the foreseeable future, we're not going to be receiving refugees because of COVID, um, but there are still refugees here that need their services. They have to find a way to um, bring in uh, funding. So um, they are moving into working um, in, in providing services related to trafficking, which Wichita is on the um, 
it would be kind of a hot spot for that. Um, and then kind of amping up their immigration work, which is helping clients that have been here for a long enough that they can apply for citizenship and things like that. Um, and even non-clients, other people just in the Wichita area that, that need help with that. Anybody else from IRC want to jump in there? I also think that they're all working remotely right now. Hi, Nayu. Yeah, and I think Jen, Jen Raft, am I? Yeah, yeah. Jen Raft, or I believe, is that, is that, am I, am I getting that right, Jen? Did you were, you, you worked at our, our libraries, isn't that? Am I, I did. Yes, hi, Jen. And I know that Jen, um, Jen, you, is that what you're, because I know that, you know, you left your job at the library. Is that, is that what you're, you're still doing now is working with refugees? Yes. Um, so I'm still with the IRC. Um, I'm in AmeriCorps VISTA um, in the immigration department. And I mean, Kayleen, you really nailed it. Um, <laughs> we provide um, low, free and low cost immigration services to both um, refugee clients, but also to the Wichita community in general. So anything from family petitions or um, adjustment of status with green cards mm -hmm. or um, applying for US citizenship. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, and it was, it, Jenna, Jenna, I'm glad, to, good to see you. Um, it's been yeah, quite a while. And um, it was, we all, I know we always thought it was so cool that, you know, you're working at, at the, when you were working with us and at the same time doing all this great work for, for refugees and, uh, and resettlement. So, yeah, very cool. Um, let's see, I, I kind of... Uh, now you, is there anything you want to add to... Yes, if you... A little bit short, but first yeah. of all, I'm sorry, we stole Jen from Newton. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> She's been such a great staff to work with, so we are lucky to have. And a little bit update about the program. So yes, as Katie told us, so we kind of shifting to uh, provide more programs in our community not only our refugees. So we start doing a uh, youth program, but not other community yet. But in the future, we want to provide a youth program, not only ISC uh, students, to the any immigrant immigrant students, and uh, of course, um, students who need the support. And also, we are planning to launch a financial literacy program soon. Uh, this program, going to be more broad audience, not only uh, ISC clients, mm -hmm. too. So more coming. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's great. That, that's really great. Um, yeah, Kat, Catherine said, uh, you know, the people, people working at IRC are great people and wonderful support for refugees and a great organization. Yeah. Um, Awesome. And uh, let's see. Oh, I, I wonder, um, so what, I, I mean, are, are you kind of between projects now or do you have any, any new, um, you know, projects that you're working on, things that you're thinking about photographing? Oh, uh, no, because the world, the way that it is. Yeah. It's hard to think about getting out and um, connecting again in person. I was thinking of that as I said, I love to shoot with my 35 millimeter lens because it means I have to be close to you. And then I thought, oh, I should probably get a longer lens so that I don't have to get so close to people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real uh, reset mm -hmm. way of thinking about the world right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, maybe get, get, a, get a telephoto. Yeah really social distance that way totally so, i uh, know that there were a lot of photographers who did that early in um covid that uh were trying to find ways to still be working and so they did like porch sessions and um you know said i i'll come and shoot from your sidewalk and your family can just be sitting on the porch and um, i actually did do that with a couple of families but um, not a huge series or anything like that. Cool. Well, um, does, uh, 
Oh yeah, oh, Marianne, Marianne, our director uh, said, you know, Humanities Kansas is, is, I guess they're looking for photographers to, uh, to tell the local mm -hmm. stories of COVID. Yeah. Uh, that sounds really cool. I'm gonna yeah, have sure. to find some more info on that and definitely share it with um, our photography email list and stuff like that. Yeah, that's um, a great idea. Yeah. I could just take, um, take photos of my, of my house, like, you know. Yeah. I uh, made a video back in April or May um, that was just kind of centered around um, ways that we hold on to our humanity in a time like this when we're so isolated. Um, so I guess that was my little contribution. Yeah. Very cool. Well, does any uh, does anybody have any any last questions or uh, or Blaze? I don't know if you can talk because you're at work, so don't get in trouble. But is there anything that you want to add about your uh, fundraising or getting your wife here? Just shake your head yeah. no. Yeah, we did. He doesn't. I don't see the little microphone symbol, so I don't okay. think he has an audio. But okay. um, I did put the link to to the GoFundMe page in the comments, um, both in the chat here on Zoom and in the Facebook. So definitely click on that. I I definitely will be to learn learn more about that. Um, I really Blaze hope that your family can join you soon, um, and uh, that'll be such a happy day when that happens. Uh, so so that yeah. Um, well, I guess um, I guess that we'll we'll wrap we'll wrap it up here. Um, Kayleen, thank you again so much for joining us, and uh, you know you'd be welcome to come back anytime. You know the next time you've got a a project to show off or something like that, I think we'd love to hear about it. This was so amazing not only to see the photos but to see the the stories of mm -hmm. of these refugees and just put a put a human face on this. Yeah, these are all our Wichita neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, I am um...